All right. Well, it is 12, 11, so we are starting. Uh, so this is Marga Hugo. I am the president of the Rotary Club of Chicago, and I am calling you from Cordoba, Argentina, where I am visiting my father. But please don't tell anybody that I am here because I came to see my dad, who is very excited to be turned 94 years old in the month of May. So it is a very special time that we are having here together. And all what I do is to be with him. So friends, uh, um, we can ring the electronic bell to get the meeting started. And uh, if not, I will say, <laughs> thank you, Shelby. It's great. And um, well, I am in the 5,608th right. and today uh, we, uh, we have uh, Doug Noll, who is going to be introduced by uh, David Hirsch. Uh, thanks, Marga. Great to be with everyone. Uh, and I'm still slumming it in the uh, Cayman Islands. Um, I'm going to wait until the weather turns a little bit nicer. Like oh, I'm sorry? well, you know, in, <laughs> David, in Argentina, I have now 91 degrees. Can you beat that in the Cayman Islands? <laughs> no. It's in the mid to high 80s, but uh, um, you win the uh, long distance award and the uh, hottest temperature award. <laughs> but uh, all joking aside, um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be with everybody today. And it's my privilege to introduce uh, Doug Knoll of Fresno County, uh, California. And by brief background, uh, Doug earned his BA in English from Dartmouth, his JD from McGeorge School of Law, and a master's in peacemaking and conflict studies from Fresno Pacific University. And for the first 20 years of his career, Doug had a distinguished career as a corporate lawyer. Since then, his career has taken a rather significant turn, and he is now a professional mediator, recognized expert in the area of peacemaking, in Conflict Resolution, co-founder of Prison of Peace, and author of four books, including the Amazon best-selling book, De-Escalate, How to Calm an Angry Person in 90 Seconds or Less. And this is gonna be a little bit of a dark humor, but I was thinking uh, maybe you should spend 90 seconds with Vladimir Putin um, and see if we can uh, make some forward progress on what's going on there. But um, in all seriousness, uh, Doug's story is a rather remarkable one, given his humble beginnings. Uh, he was the first of five born into his family. He was blind, deaf, club-footed, and underwent corrective surgery at age three. And in his own words, it was a miserable childhood. And as a point of reference, in fourth grade, his eyesight was 2040. Uh, we're in for a real treat today, Doug. Thank you for taking the time to share your story and some insights with the Rotary Club of Chicago and our guests. The Zoom stage is yours. Unmute myself. All right, there we go. Thank you, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Great. You're good, Great. Doug. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll, uh, what I am going to take the next 20 minutes is to is to take you through uh, at a 50,000 foot level. Um, the essence of what I teach, and that is a, a very specific set of skills that would allow you to stop all fights and arguments in your life forever. I know that's a big claim, but it is a technique that I've been, I developed in 2005 and have been teaching since then. We introduced it as a foundational skill in our Prison of Peace project starting in 2010, and in that project uh, with my colleague Laurel Coffer, we train murderers and life uh, inmates incarcerated in prison, maximum security prisons, how to be peacemakers and mediators to stop prison violence. Um, and I've, I teach there and I've taught at the Congressional bu Budget Office, teaching senior analysts at the CBO how to de-escalate members of Congress <laughs> and their staff, which is, was pretty interesting, I have to say. So I'm going to go through this at a very high level. There, there's a lot of detail that I'm not going to have time in 20 minutes to share with you, but I'll just give you the highlights. And then we'll reserve some time at the end for questions and, of course, the link to my website, my email address. If anyone wants to follow up with me, we'll, we'll follow. So without further ado, let me bring up my screen. And so this is 
basically, this is how to calm an angry person in 90 seconds or less. It's the foundational skill of relationships, peace, and life. And I love talking to Rotarians because I know that a Rotary is really big in, in, uh, in the peace movement around the world. And this is a foundational skill that I think everybody can use for that purpose. And I have been asked whether or not I could do anything with Vladimir Putin, and the answer is no. And that's a whole separate discussion <laughs> that I could get into. But let's get started on this. So as human beings in general, I'm going to make some fairly broad statements here. Uh, we're really good at solving problems, but we're not really that good at relationships. And the reason for that is because we have two systems in our brain that regulate how we solve problems and how we engage in relationships. The first system is called the task-focused system. And the second system is called the social system of the brain. Our whole society, our whole culture, for thousands and thousands of years, even today, is all about educating the task-focused system. So, for example, in school, we gain knowledge. We learn about rules and procedures and algorithms, starting with something as simple as learning a multiplication table or basic rules of grammar all the way up to advanced physics. We learn about critical thinking processes. We learn how to reason. We learn about logic. We learn about probability analysis. We learn about quantitative and qualitative analysis. We learn about the scientific method. These are all things that we learn in school to train the task-focused system of our brain. But we're not taught skills that strengthen the social system of our brain such as learning empathy, which is a skill that must be learned and practiced, like riding a bicycle. Uh, we don't learn about emotions. Most, most people don't even know what emotions are. Uh, we don't learn how to listen. We don't learn how to reflect on what we've heard, especially reflecting back to a speaker from the speaker's frame of reference. We don't learn how to de-escalate ourselves and others when we become highly emotional. We don't learn anything about emotional intelligence other than it exists. Um, we are not taught how to be emotionally self-aware, and most importantly, we are not taught how to reprogram the childhood triggers that cause us so much trouble in our adult lives. So philosophy, and the reason for this is structural, I think. Uh, we've had, since way before the Greeks, way before uh, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, we, uh, philosophers and theologians have been teaching us that what separates humans from other species of animals on the planet is our ability to reason. And Aristotle said that specifically, he said that what separates men from animals is the ability to reason. Well, that, and, and if you follow this thought through, you'll see that you can move into more modern times. Immanuel Kant, great German philosopher, said that emotions are bad, uh, ra rationality is good. Um, the um, Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo, who was the guy who was, he was the philosopher and theologian that really constructed the Catholic theology, said that the only way you can get to heaven is through reason. And he also said women can't reason. <laughs> only men can reason. So highly sexist. Uh, so this, this, this and, and as a result of that, there has been a over-privileging of rationality and a complete under-privileging, in fact, the meaning of emotion. Well, it turns out that human beings, there is no such thing as rationality. And, and I know that's surprising, but I, I, I teach a graduate course at Pepperdine University in, in decision making, and one of the first question I ask my students is, give me a definition of rationality. And they can't. And in fact, there is no clean definition of rationality that everybody can agree upon. And what's even more significant is that Neuroscience over the last 20 years has given us a whole new insight, and that is that we are 98% emotional and only 2% rational. We are emotional beings, not rational beings. And what separates us from animals is not a rationality, it's our emotions. Humans are the only species on the planet that actually have this thing that we call emotions. And I get pushed back all the time, well, what about my dog or my cat? They, they don't have emotions. They have something called affect, which I'll talk about in just a moment. So we have spent all this time and effort over all these thousands of years ignoring the one thing that makes us human, which is our emotions. And in fact, emotions are uh, oftentimes uh, devalued. Emotions are weak. You know, be tough. Uh, and 
Emotions are irrational. Don't be a sissy. Don't be a girly girl. Be a big boy. All of these different invalidating phrases that we grow up with are telling us not to feel. And it turns out that that kind of emotional invalidation is the most insidious and pervasive form of abuse that can exist and parents do to their children every day. Um, there's a study out of San Diego called the ACEs study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And it shows that when children are emotionally abused, simply through emotional invalidation, the likelihood of them dying from cancer or diabetes or chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease or, or a number of other morbid diseases later in life raises, rises exponentially based on the emotional abuse they suffered as children. So neuroscience tells us that emotions dominate rationality. You can't even be rational unless you're emotional first. So I think it behooves us to understand a little bit more about what emotions are and how they work and then how we can use emotions to stop fights and arguments forever. And in fact, that's what's so amazing about this process. So let's start with a definition. Emotions are biologically based patterns of perception, experience, physiology, action, and communication that are culturally created in our brains. And here's, if the first big takeaway from my talk is that we're 98% emotional and 2% rational, the second big takeaway is that we are not born with emotions. We have to learn how to create emotions and that process starts at about 18 months of age. And we start learning how to turn something called affect, which we are born with, into that thing that we call emotion. So let's explore that a little further. All emotion is based on affect. And affect is the general sense of feeling that you experience throughout the day. Fundamentally, it's, do I feel good? Do I feel pleasantness or unpleasantness? And it has two components. The first is valence. It can be positive, negative, or neutral and it's arousal state. How intense is this affective experience that I'm having? Affect arises from a process, I don't want to get too deep here, into a process known as brain interoception, which is the brain's way of monitoring the internal physiological state to tell us, to give, us to give the whole body, our whole being, information about what's going on around us. And so affect can make us approach, or it can make us withdraw, or, and it, can, it protects us in many ways. It gives us information about the environment, but it is not emotion. So depending upon who you talk to, there can be as few as four affect, or as many as nine affect. I follow the model developed by psychologist Sylvan Tompkins, which is a nine affect model, and he divides affect into these three valences, positive, neutral, and negative. The positive affects are interest and excitement, and happiness and joy. Neutral affect is surprise startle. You can just imagine being pleasantly surprised uh, by a gift that you receive from somebody or not so pleasantly surprised if you almost step on a rattlesnake. So, so surprise startle is uh, neutral. And then we have six negative affects which include fear, terror, distress, anguish, anger, rage, disgust, dismell, which is sort of the feeling you get when you smell uh, spoiled milk, and shame humiliation. Each of these negative, each, in fact, all of these affects, to one degree or another, have been mapped to various circuits in the brain so that we know that affect arises as a physiological response to either environmental stimuli or cues and also to memory. But it's still not emotion. So we have, if you think of affect as being an artist's palette, you can see that we have, we can combine all the, these nine different affects in various ways. We can have a pleasant valence and high arousal, or a pleasant valence and moderate arousal, and all the way around the circle. And then we can combine these things. For example, we could have, we could experience an unpleasant valence with high arousal at the same time that we're experiencing pleasant valence with high arousal. That's a really intense experience. So as these affects are, all occur at the same time, they, for lower animals, it just, it, there are patterns of behavior that animals have learned, oftentimes they're hardwired into their genes, that we don't have as humans. And we have to learn how to manage all of this affective experience. And we do that by developing this thing we called emotion. So basically, at about 18 months of age, 
We go through, we, if we're lucky, we go through a process known as emotional categorization. And basically that means that we can take this affective state that we're experiencing and turn it into an intentional state. We can actually bring it into consciousness and we can give it a name. I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I feel disrespected, I feel abandoned, I feel sad. So we are able to label the affect in a way that allows our prefrontal cortex to give meaning to it and work with it. It also allows us to draw inferences about what caused the affect of change. What just got me so angry? We can start asking questions and look around. It allows us, it informs us what to do next. So should I punch this guy's lights out? Should I slap the guy that just insulted my wife in front of a hundred million audience on television as happened the other night? Uh, you know, and finally, and most importantly, emotional categorization, turning affect into emotion, allows us to communicate what we're experiencing to other people. And if we didn't have this ability to, to these four abilities to, to categorize affect into emotion, we, we wouldn't be much better off than, than other animals because our, uh, other animals cannot categorize into emotion, their affect into emotion. So that gets us into emotional granularity, which is the ability to, spe to specify the emotional experience that we're having with specificity. And so when we think about granularity, it can go from low to high. So we can have a negative affect, which can then go to a fairly broad emotion that we would call anger. But we can subdivide anger into a number of different subcategories. In fact, there are dozens and dozens of words that subdivide different forms of anger. And all these different words do are describe different mixes of an affective state that we're experiencing in the moment. Now, what happens if we're not able to emotionally categorize? Well, then we fall into a condition called alexithemia. And in fact, in all conflict, all fights and arguments of all kinds, whether it's domestic or business or community or political or even international, all conflict participants suffer from alexithemia, and that is the impaired ability to categorize affect into emotion. They cannot be self-reflective because their emotions are dominating their prefrontal cortex. And what studies show is that when people become alexithemic because they're in a fight or flight or they're, and they're in a deep argument or they're deeply emotional, they don't have the ability, they lose the ability, in fact, to express emotion with any granularity. They have decreased capacity to, to cope with strong emotions. Their core affect is experienced somatically. And without emotional categorization, they cannot make decisions. It's impossible for, for people to make decisions. And you can see why, the, why this is so important to me as a professional mediator and peacemaker. When I'm w called into conflicts, intense conflicts where there's high emotion, how can I expect people to make good decisions about what they want to do with this conflict if they're in an emotional state that impairs their decision-making ability? So I've been highly motivated to study this. Um, negative affect is more intensely experienced than positive affect. People have very low emotional intelligence when they are alexithemic, and they are much, much more reactive. When you see people, a 40-year-old acting like a six-year-old when he or she is really angry, that's exactly what they are. They have regressed back to six years old where they were blocked emotionally, probably because of emotional invalidation, and all, they've lost their connection to their emotional database, so now they're just reacting on childhood programming that they, that they learned from their parents at six years old, and that's all they've got. And that person is alexithemic, and once they get into a conflict, it's very difficult for them to get out. And of course, decreased empathy. So the foundational skill of peace that I have discovered is that we're gonna calm people down by reducing their alexithemic tendencies. And we're gonna do that through a process known as affect labeling. We're gonna label the affect. And the process that I have developed, that I have successfully taught tens of thousands of people, including ranging, as I said before, from people serving life sentences in maximum security prisons to senior analysts at the Congressional Budget Office, is to do a three-step process. This is where you take notes. Number one, ignore the words. When you're, when you're confronted by an angry person or an upset person, ignore what they're saying. You can afford to do that for the 90 seconds it's gonna take you to go through this process. Just ignore the words, it's white noise, especially if somebody's yelling at you. And when you do that, two things happen. One, you're less likely to get triggered yourself. 
and more importantly, you free up bandwidth to do the next two steps. Step number two is you're going to guess at the emotions. Now I say this because many people who are not particularly skilled in emotional communication don't actually believe that they have the ability to read other people's emotions. But it turns out that our brains have an innate ability to accurately and quickly read another person's emotions. And there's a long history of evolutionary biology about how we develop this skill that I, I won't take the time to go into now. But just let me just say that we have this innate ability. We don't develop it because we privilege rationality over emotions. But if you just give yourself a moment to be in silence, to quiet your mind, and look at the speaker who's very emotional, within a second or two, the emotions that that person is experiencing will come into your consciousness. And then you engage in the third step which is to reflect back the speaker's emotional experience with a simple use statement. So for example, if David Hirsch were really mad at me, I'd say, David, <laughs> there he is. David, man, you are really angry. You're pissed off. You feel frustrated. You feel disrespected. Nobody's listening to you. You don't feel supported and you feel unappreciated and you're sad and you're really anxious and worried because you don't know what's going to happen next. You feel betrayed and completely abandoned. And this whole thing is just really, really getting you angry. Notice how all I did was reflect emotional words, his emotional experience, using a use statement. I didn't use that old Thomas Gordon I statement stuff that's never worked, never will work. That active listening stuff is completely discredited, although many people still teach it. It's you statement telling David what he's experiencing. And what the science shows is this. Affect labeling relative to other forms of encoding diminish the response of the amygdala. We've all heard about the amygdala. We have two of them, one on each side of our brains, and other limbic regions to negative emotion. So as we affect label somebody, we are inhibiting the emotional centers that have caused that strong emotion in the first place. Additionally, affect labeling increased activity in a single brain region, the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. So as you affect label somebody, not only are you inhibiting the emotional centers of their brain, you're also reactivating their prefrontal cortex, which connects them then to their emotional database, and all of a sudden they get control of themselves. Finally, the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex and amygdala activity during affect labeling were inversely correlated, a relationship that was mediated by activity in the medial prefrontal cortex. And so what basically, what Lieberman is saying here, Matthew Lieberman out of UCLA, what, what he's basically saying is that as the prefrontal cortex comes back online, the emotional centers quiet down and people calm down. And in fact, that is exactly what happens. When you affect label somebody, you literally calm them down in less than 90 seconds. And it's absolutely magical to watch when you do it. So this was a seminal study published in 2007 by Lieberman and his colleagues out of his labs at UCLA. There have been this, and very, I won't bore you with the neuroscience, you're my graduate students, we'd be going into this a lot more detail. <laughs> just to show you, this is what the circuits that we're talking about, and I'll just leave it at that because everybody gets glazed over when they start seeing the brain. Um, so other studies that follow the Lieberman study have shown that Academic labeling is associated with academic competence. What the study is really remarkable, it shows that when parents start affect labeling their children at about three or four years old, by the time they're nine or 10, they're usually two grade levels ahead of their peers in school, just by labeling the child's emotions and helping the child's brain develop emotional capacity, as opposed to emotionally invalidating. Um, same thing with social competence. Kids who are affect labeled by their parents show much, much higher social competence, and they are more, more liked by their peers. They are much more sociable than, than their peers. Um, it also shows affect labeling is, uh, demonstrates greater engagement in pro-social behavior. And this is interesting because I have verified this in my own field studies in the prison project, where I've taken people who were completely emotionally shut down, uh, hardcore gangbangers, murderers all, and within six to eight weeks, they're completely different human beings once they get in touch with their emotions because they have practiced affect labeling both on themselves and with other people in their prison population. And it is absolutely miraculous to watch. It's that their brains can reprogram that quickly. Um, I'll just say by on that subject, we have trained over 20,000 inmates in the Prison of Peace Project to be peacemakers and mediators. In California, approximately three to 4,000 have been released on parole, not one report of recidivism. Not one of our students has ever reoffended once released from prison. 
And we're talking about people who are serving life sentences for some kind of homicide or murder. Um, and finally, what we see is the most emotional and, uh, emotional and impulse control in children if their parents take the time to ethic label them. And this is true in adults as well. So, I know I only have 20 minutes. Looks like I used it all up pretty quickly. Uh, if you want to learn, I'll, I'm here for questions. That's a copy of my a picture of my fourth book, which you can get on Amazon or go to my website and get it. Um, you can learn more about all of this. I've written about this extensively on my website at dugnoll.com. And if any of you want to reach out to me with questions, um, I'm happy to respond to you by email or set up a Zoom call with you, Doug at dugnoll.com. And I think I've almost worn out my welcome. Time for questions. Well, Doug, thank you for a very impressive uh, presentation. Um, and uh, thank you for not going uh, more granular than you did because uh, my eyes did start to glaze over and I was starting to get very angry with you. Well, David, you really got angry and frustrated and you were a little concerned that I might run over time. But all joking aside, uh, I've read the book. It's an amazing uh, piece, so I can highly recommend it. And I'm wondering to start with, um, I'm just going to ask a question or two, and then I would remind all of our participants, if you do have a question, please put it in the chat, and I'll try to get to each one of those. Um, how can somebody start to practice this if they want to just implement some of these ideas uh, in a very practical way? You know, it's mostly adults um, on the Zoom call today, so maybe use an example or two that an adult uh, speaking to another adult, it could be a spouse, it could be a coworker, it could be a sibling, you know, somebody that, you know, you might have uh, some tension with occasionally. Right. So what I teach in my courses and on my, um, and in my coaching and in my graduate courses is to start with in very safe emotional environments where, where if you fail, you will not embarrass yourself. So, um, Where's the best place to do that? Starbucks. So you go into Starbucks or a coffee shop of your, a coffee house of your choice, and you go up to the barista in the morning and you say, wow, you look really happy this morning. Or you look, you look like you're really excited because almost always they are because they're early morning people and they're people people. And then you walk, you put your lab coat on and you watch what happens. And invariably the barista will light up get re super excited because you have just listened that person into existence and everybody behind you will get angry at you because now you <laughs> the priest is now giving you his or her life story while, while they're all waiting for their their lattes so you'll have to affect label your way out the door to keep from getting hit um, start in, in low risk situations like that if you want to get the best service you've ever had at a restaurant Ethic label your server. And you know, these days they're stressed people. So you would say, wow, you look really stressed out today. You look like you're in a hurry or you're tired. Whatever it might be, just read their emotion really quickly. First thing that comes to your mind and say, you are or you feel. Very low risk. And you're gonna do, and then observe. Just don't do it and then shut your mind down. Observe what happens. And you will, um, you'll see some really amazing stuff happens. And after you've done that for a couple of weeks, then you can start start on it with friends and then you can start on it with coworkers, and then maybe four or five weeks in you can very gently introduce it into your more intimate relationships i tell people do not try this with your spouse or your partner because it will disrupt the relationship too rapidly and can cause some problems and there's a long explanation why that is i don't have time today to go through all that but just take it easy uh, if you've got small children or grandchildren four or five six seven years old this works great with them you can also practice on your cat or your dog. They like it too, even though they don't have emotions. Okay, let's get to some of the questions. I'm hoping we'll have time. Marga, you can just cut me off whenever you think you want to go back to whatever Rotary does on a weekly basis. Um, okay, so this says, good evening, Douglas. Uh, thank you for the presentation and the tips. What is the best way to negotiate with criminal inaction, with the criminal inaction? One question. Uh, would he see that as a weakness? Shouldn't he be contained or at least firmly confronted first? Let's imagine this is a question about just a simple serial killer. Well, you, you probably would not use affect labeling if you're if you're confronting somebody who's in in the midst of committing a violent crime. Uh, affect labeling probably would not be appropriate. You've got to restrain that person and 
collect evidence and do whatever, you know, police procedures that might maybe maybe later on affect labeling might be effective, but not in not in the moment of violence. Now, if 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 you're in a domestic dispute, and let's say you're a police officer and you're in a domestic dispute and there has not yet been violence, um, affect labeling is extremely powerful to calm people down. You basically listen to their emotions, listen them into existence. They'll calm down. The, the potential for violence diminishes rapidly, and now you can go about problem solving. Where people make big mistakes with highly emotional people is to do to, to immediately jump to problem solving or to do command, like calm down. All that does is get people even angrier. It just escalates matters. De-escalate, then problem solve. But don't de-escalate in violent situations because it's, it's gone too far and you've got to, that person has to be restrained. Okay. Quite well made. So another question is, for folks with whom we need to use the three-step process, will that process used over time with that person start to help that person become better in touch with their emotions? Yes, short answer. I've seen it happen thousands of times in prison and elsewhere. And not only does it help the other person who that you're labeling become in touch with their emotions and become more self-aware, it also builds up your self-awareness. So every time you ethic label, you are building your own emotional intelligence. So you get a double, you get a twofer on this one. It's really powerful. I have, I wish I had more time to tell you stories out of the prison project of what I have witnessed. And it, all I can tell you is that it has never failed in prison, thousands and thousands of times, and it has completely transformed lives in ways that you can't even imagine. Well, go ahead and tell one story. <laughs> All right, I'll tell the story that I write in my book and I'll try to keep it quick. Uh, we were in a fifth week of training at Valley State Prison for Women where we started the project in California. That was the largest, most violent women's prison in the world. We were assigned 15 women, all of them serving life or long-term sentences. All of them had killed somebody in some way or another. And in week five, we, Laurel and I showed up in this dingy conference room. Let me tell you, teaching in prison is not easy. Uh, and they're not, it's not conducive to doing teaching. It's not big some corporate teaching center that we're all used to. It's very, very tough. Uh, but we showed up and there was a woman there, uh, one of our students named Sarah, who was quietly crying in the corner. And, and so we walked and she, we were the first ones there and Sarah was there a little bit in front of us. And we got there and Laurel kneeled next to her and said, what's going on? And Sarah told us this story. She said, I've been in prison for 18 years. Uh, I'm serving a 25 to life sentence because as a drunk driver, I killed a family of four. And I came out of that accident without a scratch, but I completely destroyed a whole family. When I was sentenced, I had to give up my three-year-old son to my sister to raise. And I've written him a letter every single week since I've been in prison, but I've never heard from him. He's never called me. He's never written me a letter. All I do, all I know is what I hear from my sister when I talk to her. Earlier this week, I decided to write a letter, an ethic label, how he must feel with a mother who's completely abandoned him, as I have. And so I did. I wrote a long letter, just reflecting his feelings. And today, for the first time in 18 years, I received a letter back from him. Now, the letter was very, very angry. But at the end, he said, Mom, I love you. I'm bringing my girlfriend and will come visit you in three weeks. And then she started crying again. And when I heard that story, that was, the, that was the first big story. And of course, I've heard hundreds since then. Um, my jaw dropped. I said, oh, my God, this is so powerful. And I mean, Laurel and I were almost in tears. And that's the kind of profound effect that this work has and ethic labeling has in particular. All, he, all she had to do was listen her son into existence, validate his emotional experience. And the estrangement ended, and he wanted to come see her. And I've seen, I do a lot of family business conflicts and a lot of family conflicts, and every, the, the same thing happens every single time. Once people feel deeply heard, they can put aside their differences and find peace. It's amazing. Yeah, well, the point I think you just made is that it does not have to be a verbal uh, communication, right? It could be a written communication. Right? Sure, it um, works. Obviously, yeah. a verbal communication is better, but it can be by letter or texting. You know, I teach my graduate students the way I deal with the snarky comments on my YouTube channel is just affect label, <laughs> and then they go away. <laughs> That's simple. 
Okay, let's get back to a couple of questions. Um, so uh, Lisa asks, what's the difference between affect labeling and active listening? Active listening is a term that was coined by psychologist uh, Thomas Gordon in 1958. He was a student of the great humanist psychologist Carl Rogers. Gordon's work was good, but it was completely misconstrued and misunderstood by the human potential movement. And if you've ever taken an active listening class, you've probably learned something like what it's something to, you're supposed to say something like what I hear you saying is or what I think you're feeling. It's all I centered. That's a misperception. That's called active listening. And that's a misperception of what Gordon was teaching has been misconstrued for over 60 years, 70 years. Um, Carl, Carl uh, Rosenberg uh, was also a PhD, uh, got his PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison along with Ro Rogers and then later Gordon and then later Rosenberg. And he basically took, from what I can tell, uh, took, took uh, Gordon's work and rebranded it into nonviolent communication. And if any of you have taken any NBC courses, or now they call it compassionate communication, you should quickly recognize that it's a very complex way of listening that will not work in the heat of the moment. And also, and that's another form of active listening that doesn't work. When we're affect labeling, we're doing something different. It's called reflective listening. And it's speaker oriented. We're, speaking, we're listening from a speaker's frame of reference so that the speaker knows that we understand exactly what the speaker is seeing and feeling and hearing and experiencing from that person's frame of reference. So we call that Reflective listening, there are four levels of reflective listening, and affect, label, affect labeling is the deepest of the four levels. Okay, Using thank you. Giving. So another question from Marga. Uh, when we are being born, which I think must be the most traumatic event in one person's life, except dying in a traumatic way, such as war, the born child isn't he or she experiencing emotions. No. Uh, or when a baby is not held or experienced experiences attachment to another human being, for example, in an orphanage, aren't those emotions at a very early age? Babies do not have the capacity to experience emotion because the limbic system in the brain and the other emotional centers in the brain are not, they're not online yet. They're not even developed. It takes 18 months for that part of the brain to start to develop. What babies are born with, all of us, is affect. So we have these nine affect and in fact, Sylvan Tompkins developed the nine affect model by studying infants. And he was trying to understand what, what are the experiences that are innate in a human baby. And he identified these nine basic affects that every single baby ex demonstrates, but they're not emotions. They're not emotions until we start turning them into emotions. And we can't start doing that until we start to verbalize, we start to talk, which happens at about 18 months. At the same time, the emotional centers of our brain come, start coming online. So it's a childhood development process. And we make a big mistake when we think that young children have emotions when they really don't. And even then, uh, a two-year-old or a three-year-old, their emotions are rudimentary. That's why when I talk, about, talk to parents and talk about parenting, parents have to be emotional coaches, which of course is a difficult thing to ask a parent when a parent's never been coached themselves on, on emotional coaching. So they don't have the skill set they can't pass it on, which is why we get the cycle of dysfunction generation after generation in all the in families. In fact, uh, social scientist and therapist Virginia Satir said that 96% of all families are emotionally dysfunctional. And it perpetuates itself because we can't, until we can teach parents to be emotionally competent and coach their children to be emotionally competent, they can only teach what they know. Another question from Dr. Nunez, which is, has de-escalation been included in the consent decree for police departments? No. Uh, I have worked with law enforcement. Uh, they give lip service to this sort of stuff. Now, now it's interesting in the post standards, especially in California, there is a whole section on de-escalation and communication skills. But when you talk to individual, uh, when you talk to law enforcement agencies, whether police departments or sheriff's departments, they're, they give it lip service at best. It's a check the box kind of thing. And the people that teach it don't know what they're talking about. And they move on to more, more fun things like how to shoot a gun or s skid a car or something like that, you know, restrain somebody. They're really not interested in learning how to deescalate. They say they are, but they really aren't. Okay, the next question comes from Eric. It says regarding 
guessing one's emotions in the three-step process, I've noticed, especially with some men I know, seemingly all the negative emotions, shame, fear, et cetera, all get expressed as anger. How do we identify the true emotions under the anger? So what, um, there are emotions come in layers and there are six different layers. You really only need to learn about 12 or 15 words, but they come in different layers. So the first layer is going to, the typically the first layer is anger. So there are anger emotions like anger, annoyance, frustration, or yeah, anger, annoyance could be frustration, irritation, rage. Then the next layer are the dignitary emotions, such as disrespect, injustice, not being heard, not being appreciated. Then underneath that, you have the fear emotions, fear, anxiety, being scared, being worried. Underneath that, you have shame, humiliation, guilt, and embarrassment. Underneath that, you have sadness and grief. And then underneath that, you have abandonment and not feeling loved or lovable. I just went through that really quick. So you go back and look at the recording. Those six layers teach you wh what emotions to watch for, and you and you start your affect labeling at whatever label at whatever la layer is presenting first. So somebody might present with sadness, and I'll start affect labeling sadness, but then I'll see the anger, and I'll affect label the anger, and so you just move from layer to layer, and just and, and once you start learning how to do this it becomes very obvious what people are experiencing. Most people, because they are not emotionally intelligent, they are not emotionally skilled, have a very limited repertoire of emotional behaviors. And although it may seem to the unskilled eye that there's total chaos, to the skilled eye, you begin to see that people are incredibly predictable about how they behave in situations, which what my, why my work works is I can walk into a conflict and see exactly what's going on and what's causing it, and I know exactly what to say, how to say it, and when to say it, no matter how intense the situation, and to calm things down. And that's a skill anybody can learn. You all can learn how to do that. But it takes a little bit of time and practice to, to master that skill. But it's not, some, it's not a lifetime thing. It's, when I say a little bit of time, I'm talking weeks of practice, maybe a month or two of practice to, to get good at it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Joel says, thank you. I've always learned a lot about I statements, and you mentioned them being thoroughly debunked. Could you elaborate or point me toward further reading? Yeah. So I statements are really important when you're talking about your own emotions. So for example, if I were angry, I would say I am really angry. And what we teach, what we teach in the prison project is to manage those strong emotions. We, we try, and this really does come from the work of Thomas Gordon. What we, what we, what we would say is, um, when you leave your clothes on the floor, I feel really disrespected, and it really makes me angry. So what we're doing is calling out a behavior, and which is objective, and then we're calling out our own emotional reaction to that behavior. And then if you want to call to action, you can say, will you be willing to talk about how we can change that so that I, I'm not always so pissed off? That's an appropriate use of an I statement. What happened when Gordon's work is that people who did not understand what he was doing took the I statement and they made it into a passive voice experience. What I hear you saying is that you are angry. And the reason that doesn't work is, number one, it's not speaker focused, it's listener focused on me. Two, it's in the passive voice, which is the language of disconnection. So I'm dis disconnecting, I'm distancing myself by using passive voice. And as you, you probably have all experienced, when somebody uses that kind of passive voice, I statement reflection on you, it, it makes you more angry because you don't feel like you're being listened to. And that's a universal experience. Um, I have written a blog on this. Uh, if you go to dugnall.com or just Google, uh, Nonviolent Communication, Three Basic Truths, I think is the name of the blog. I, I, I explore all of this in great detail. I got really interested in it because I get this question all the time. So I wrote a quite a lengthy blog that will talk about all this with some citations to other material. Victoria asks, what motivates most life inmates you are training to be peacemakers in max security prisons? <laughs> is it redemption, great... meaning of existence, or a sense of power? What is it? That's a great question. It varies from individual to individual. 
Uh, some people are really interested in the idea of learning to be a peacemaker. Some people are bored out of their minds and just said, well, this looks like an interesting program. Some people come because by the time we train our first cohort in any given institution, we've got a waiting list of hundreds of inmates wanting to get in, so every, it's by recommendation. None of them have any clue about what we really teach, and none of them have a clue about how rigorous we are. It's a very, very rigorous, difficult, um, training that we take them through just to become a certified mediator and then if they want to become trainers it's an it, it's an additional three years of training to t teach them how to be trainers and Stephanie I think what, asked go ahead I'm sorry. I, I was just gonna say I'm sorry David I think ultimately people are motivated because they want to change that's what happens so Stephanie says I'm a 2006 Pepperdine MBA graduate I wish I would have had the opportunity to take your course back then my question is how do you calm a frustrated person who isn't willing to help themselves for example i have a friend whose husband has dementia she's very frustrated with all that she has to deal with her friends and i have provided resources for help but she continues or she chooses not to learn more or to seek that help how do you deal with that well, the first thing that I would recognize if, if, is if you're trying to help her problem solve her life with her husband, you're going to fail. Nobody wants uninvited advice. And the first thing that we tend to do when we're seeing, with somebody like that, we say, well, really what you should be doing is X. And that's the worst thing you can do. Problem solving is just as bad as emotional invalidation. All you can do is have compassion for her. And as she complains bitterly about how life is so miserable and all the problems you got, you simply listen to her emotions and reflect them back without offering any kind of advice or problem solving at all. Eventually, she will feel heard. She will feel listened into existence. Maybe not in the first conversation, maybe not after the 10th conversation, but at some point in time, she will. And at that point in time, her, she will be in a place where she can either solve the problems herself or seek advice on how she should go about solving the problem. But until she's in that place, offering advice to her, trying to help her solve the problem, is, you're just going to bang your head against a wall. All you can do is be compassionate and listen to her, listen to her emotions and reflect them back. Thank you. Um, I'm getting the Zoom hook, Doug. So this is the last question. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I want Margaret to be more angry with me than she already is. Oh, well. <laughs> um, uh, how is that early childhood trauma of the experience, for example, of not being held in early years impact uh, impact children if there's no emotions at that early stage of life? I would I would say, having suffered that myself, that it is devastating. Um, there are whole parts of our brains that don't develop when we're not nurtured, soothed, held, coached in emotional competency. And what that means is that we grow up emotionally unsafe. Most people are emotionally unsafe. They're emotionally defended. They don't show their true authentic selves to other people. They are vulnerable at a very deep level, but they put on a big front about how tough they are or how strong they are, or arrogance, whatever it might be, or a happy face, pleasers, all kinds of different tricks that we use to, to hide the pain that we experienced in childhood. I know I was that way for a long time. And it's a miserable way to be, and it's a miserable way to live. What you, when you start this project of ethic labeling, as I said before, and you start developing your own emotional competency, you start becoming emotionally self-aware, you start learning how to modulate your own emotions, you learn how to be cognitive and affective empathy by ethic labeling, things start to change in your life and you start to accept the pain that you grew up with and you learn how to create emotional safety for yourself and for others and emotions are no longer scary things to be to run away from um, I'll never forget one of my one of that one of the women in that first cohort uh, who is now out, out of prison married two children doing fabulous uh, said I used to run away from emotions now I run towards them because I've learned that not only are they not scary, they're essential to who we are as human beings. And this was a woman who was serving, you know, 25 to life at, and went to prison at 20 years old. 
Well, that wraps up my responsibilities. Doug, I just want to thank you uh, on behalf of the Rotary Club of Chicago. Uh, and my, from a personal perspective, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us today and enlightening us on the importance of affect labeling. Um, the name of the most recent book that you wrote is Deescalate. I can highly recommend it. It's available where books are sold. And um, we'd love to have you come back and uh, see if we've learned anything as a result of the time we've spent today. Marga, back to you. Thank you so much, Doug. I mean, you know, we are transfixed by your words because these have been very hard times for many, many people, uh, pandemic and everything that came along with it. So, um, you know, I don't think we're going to do greetings uh, to our guests. Uh, so I kindly invite all of you to come again next Tuesday, all right, to, or, or, or the next virtual meeting so you can join us, um, you know, um, I, the power of, com of compassion is immeasurable. And I think, you know, we all need it, right? And you have taught us a lot. And I'm really, really grateful on behalf of the club. Um, I think some of us are going to be looking at your book and I really do hope that uh, you can come back as well. Um, so can you hear me okay? Because I know that my internet connection is not so good. Oh, wonderful, all right. Well, you know, there is a slide that we posted on the screen, Doug, which is our thank you to you for your time and for your uh, for your you know experience that you shared with us. Well, you know, what I would like to continue now is with our announcements. And um, for all of you who are here, uh, please, you know, as you know, we have the job one the students that the candidates have been selected. We have really great kids that are going to participate in the program and this is the time when we need employers uh, this is for the summer internship you know a lot about the program so please use your rolodex and help us find employers and of course contact alita uh, who is going to uh, provide you the information you need Mm, okay, so this is really important, friends, because this is a unique opportunity we give to many uh, rising juniors and seniors on the Chicago public school system. And as you know, they need to live and well, the students are all qualified already and have been selected, but we need employers in the Chicago area as well. Uh, we have upcoming committee meetings that you can either look at the gyrator or Shelby is going to post them on the screen. So we invite you to attend them. Uh, these committees meet on Zoom. So it is really easy to join. And that's where a lot of the fun at the club happens, as you very well know. Uh, our next event is uh, the first Tuesday of the month is the um, evening event. And uh, it is, hello, a, um, uh, a tequila tasting. So, you know, I saw that very few of you signed up. So what is wrong? I mean, it's going to be a fun party. So uh, among our guests, we have staff of Solidarity Bridge that uh, Patricia Vargas has come from, is going to be uh, from Bolivia, giving us the latest um, information of the five global grants that we have done in Bolivia to provide medical equipment to these hospitals. Um, so, and then on April the 12th, we have uh, the, um, we're honoring Jesse White. It's going to be a farewell lunch uh, for, because as you know, he's not going to be Secretary of State um, as he has been for so many years. And we have a very close relationship with his foundation. So also register. The location is going to be at the Jesse White Foundation. Again, uh, the um, details are in the gyrator. All right, again, we have a limited number of guests. I think we can accommodate up to 50 guests. So be you know, register now. And then on the 19th, we have Jen Parks, who is the executive director of Habitat for Humanity. This is going to be a hybrid meeting as well as the lunch for Jesse White. All right, and on the 21st of January, we are meeting again, uh, I'm sorry, the 21st of April, we're meeting again at Cafe Chiao for a karaoke night. So we need a lot of the courageous members of our um, club to regale us with their, you know, beautiful singing. But if you cannot sing, you're allowed to come as well. All right, now, uh, about Ukraine, uh, well, okay, here, thank you, Shelby, for posting this screen. 
we have in-person volunteer opportunities. We continue to have uh, these um, opportunities to see of our grants. So um, just uh, you know, sign up, ask Sarah Buck, who is the co-chair of the Community Services Committee, if you have any questions, all right? Um, and I think that's all what we have for announcements, if I'm not mistaken. So what I wanted to uh, share with you as well is uh, what Rotary is doing in Ukraine. Um, well, there are a number of um, districts in the United States. Um, well, I have been working very closely with Pat Merriweather. Let me start with that. Uh, and reaching out to all our contacts um, uh, anywhere uh, for donations or leads to purchase certain um, medical equipment that we need. Um, so if you have uh, contacts with manufacturers of medicine or medical equipment, uh, let us know because uh, we have applied for the disaster aid grants. I'm so when I say we, it is our district 6450 um, has applied for one of these grants, uh, and we have decided to focus on providing just medical aid. We have partnered with uh, the Ukrainian Medical American Association of North America, who last Thursday shipped for free. Uh, somebody came and at the last minute offered to pay for the cargo of this charter plane with 80 tons of medical supplies that specifically had been requested by hospitals. So it is unbelievable. And you know, there are websites, there are Facebook pages already, um, email um, popping up in, on, in the internet. And it's just extraordinary to see what Rotarians are doing in, in the border countries, as well as some of the fellowships. To give you an idea, I was, um, we are working with Rotarians from Munich, who um, they're, you know, we're going to send some of the funds of these grants to buy medicines in Germany. And from Munich, they are driving in vans or trucks to, to deliver them in person to the Rotarians on the other side of the border. As well, um, you know, we're reaching out to our personal corporate contacts, you name it. I mean, the, the solidarity to help Ukraine is something that I have never seen in my life. And I'm pretty sure that, you know, uh, you haven't either, especially when it is your next door neighbor that is being bombed and it feels really close to home. But there is a fellowship uh, that, you know, um, that when the Bahamas um, um, a, a hurricane happened a few years ago, you know, somebody was says, well, if anybody has an airplane, would you be able to ship um, uh, supplies to Bahamas? And some people thought, you know, I was joking, but you know what? This fellowship, they're connecting all over Europe and they're picking up supplies and bringing them to the border countries to ship them to Ukraine. I mean, I'm looking at this websites and you know I, I i'm crying because um it is a you know rotarians there are over a thousand rotarians in the border countries providing support to the refugees and also helping them with uh, the next step in their lives you know and i'm talking about helping artists helping people be elderly helping children providing you know a mental health um uh, support so um you know, it is just so overwhelming and I have been spending a lot of time on that. Now I'm looking for a piece of equipment that is called a C-arm, which uh, the main hospital in Kiev has only one that was refurbished and donated and it really is not working. And what this C-arm does, it can detect if you've been injured by shrapnel, that this is, we're talking thousands of patients, thousands of individuals have been injured by shrapnel, but it helps detect the shrapnel that is under your skin. And so, you know, if you know somebody who is in medical, um, you know, in, the, in, in this type of business, please reach out to me because we have funds to purchase equipment uh, and we need more than one of these um, uh, C arms. Uh, what else? Uh, Umana, besides sending the airplanes, um, is uh, sending volunteers to Poland or the border countries. And since they're bringing aid to Ukraine, the, what they're carrying, is, they're carrying is aid to Ukraine, each passenger is allowed to bring 
10 full suitcases of aid. So people are going back and forth from Chicago to Poland, but you know what, Umana, they have run out of suitcases. So if you have suitcases you're not using, please bring them to the warehouse that they have. Oh, it, well, you know, there's, a, I think, it, let me say this because they are not there full time. Uh, check the information in the gyrator because, you know, in all this sadness and tragedy that are witnessing, the fact that the, all the volunteers that traveled last week to Poland with supplies, they ran out of suitcases. So this is a little something that we can do that, you know, if we have bullet, well, we cannot tra transport bulletproof vests, but, you know, we're trying to find tourniquets. We need 100,000 tourniquets to give you an idea. So we're asking, you know, we're going to be buying them from in Austria, in Germany, and we're just spreading the network of contacts everywhere. So um, again, if you know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, please uh, reach out to me. You can email me. I'll be in Argentina for a few days until I'm back on April 11th. So, um, but you know, um, there's a little something that we all can do. Uh, we have Victoria Trimble here from Lithuania and those people are brave, all right? Victoria, let me give you three minutes to tell us what you're doing in Lithuania. Thank you very much, Margo. Yes, well, we have this crazy neighbor very close to us and we are very much involved. Our district has chosen to focus on medical treatment of injured uh, warriors, because you know, if there are strong warriors who can fight, then we have this war ending faster and you know, less refugees. In general, most of the Lithuanians are also focusing on helping Blue Yellow. This is NGO, which is working in Ukraine since 2014. It was featured in Washington Post recently. So for our ever small country, 2.7 million, we raised uh, 26 million euros in uh, like one week time. So uh, we are also very much looking for supplies. We, as paraphrasing President Zelensky, we have a right, we need ammunition. Uh, our teams are delivering to the front line to inside the Ukraine, but the warehouses are almost empty. So we are also looking everywhere mm -hmm. for supplies. And I would like to thank Bernard, your brother, who has introduced me to Project Cure based in the United States, who are donating mm -hmm. some medical supplies. So we are working on matching them with hospitals. And thanks to everyone for your dedication. This is, as we call it, war against civilization. So we are all in it together. And yeah. Ukraine is at the forefront. <laughs> Yes, it is extremely painful to see, but the stakes are very high. And, um, uh, and you know, we all can do a little bit. And if you're a Rotarian, you have to be very happy. We have some of our fellow members in Ukraine that um, they are driving the supplies to the hospitals that have requested them. So if that is not service above self, I don't know what it is. Because as you know, one of the targets from the Russian army is the hospitals. So um, just pray for all these people. And, um, and then hopefully, I don't know if some of these immigrants will come to the United States, but uh, you know, we've got work to do and this is going to be going on for quite a long time. So, uh, all right, now we are going to close. Uh, let me see a couple of messages here. Mm. Uh, Yes, uh, Tamara, thank you for posting the address as a, uh, of the warehouse in Bensville, Illinois. Just so you know, they are not working every day during the day there because all the volunteers have their own jobs. So they go sometimes during the week and on weekends. So uh, go to the website that is in the, you will see in the gyrator and just ask them, when do you need volunteers and go there. You won't believe what you're going to see there because it's it's really impressive what what they're doing. So, okay. So, um, do I have any volunteers to read the four way test? <laughs> Let's do it different today, or should I pick somebody? <laughs> well, I guess. Marga. I'm sorry. Who is that? It's me, Stephanie, coming at you from Florida. Oh, Stephanie. Oh my gosh, please go ahead. It's so good to see you. 
That's okay, sweet. good you to see go, you girl. too. <laughs> okay, the four way test of the things we think, say, or do. One, is it the truth? Is it the truth? <clears throat> Two, is it fair to all concerned? Is it fair to all concerned? Three, will it build good goodwill good and better friendships? friendships? And four, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Okay, well, thank you, David, for bringing another fantastic guest. Um, I think we have all been, we have all experienced anger and resentment and emotions. And I can say that maybe we all learned something new, at least I did. So thank you, David. And I wish all of you a great afternoon, great evening. Okay. And, you know, even though I'm in Cordoba in Argentina, David, I'm extremely, je extremely jealous that you are in the Cayman Islands. <laughs> to come and visit okay <laughs> one day i promise yes all right doug thank you very much and all the best and thank you for the good work that you do